Hi there, and thank you for tuning in to Democracy Under Threat. I am Vanelda Harris, and with me today is the former Legal Affairs Minister under the PPPC administration, Mr. Anil Nandalal. Anil, thank you for joining me yet another time on this program. It's a pleasure to be here once again, and I want to thank you for inviting me to be part of your program. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all our listeners and our viewers and to thank him in advance for spending the next few minutes with us. Okay, so we're just going to jump straight into it. We know yesterday that the final work plan was decided on by the chair of the Ghana Elections Commission. And so, Anna, what I want you to tell the viewers is, we know that the that 10 motions were tabled by the PPPC commissioners on the Ghana Elections Commission. So, can you explain why those motions were tabled? All right. Um, perhaps a, a convenient point to begin is to reflect on the agony to which the population has been subject at the hands of GCOM in terms of getting this recount going. You know that a decision was made, it appears, moons ago for the recount to take place. And that decision came after tremendous struggle, public pressure, and court actions, etc., etc. We don't need to recite that for the viewers. They are very well aware of, of what transpired and the antecedent to the decision to do the recount. So when the nation finally breathed a sigh of relief that we are going to get this recount, then the process now of kicking the recount off became another agonizingly slow process. GCOM um, kept meetings after meetings, having hours and hours, marathon sessions of discussions, and nothing seemed to be coming out of it. The, the discussions seem sterile, they seem useless, and every day after day the nation waits uh, for a decision or decisions to come to propel the process forward and we are not getting that. In that entire equation, each side, meaning the government side of the commission and the opposition side of the commission, were tasked with the responsibility of preparing a work plan for consideration of the commission. And the PVP through its commissioners presented an elaborate but simple work plan. A work plan that would have expedited the process and concluded the process within 14 days. A work plan that was would have ensured integrity of the process. A work plan that would have ensured that the process would have been transparent. A work plan that would have ensured that toxic people, people who were condemned by the international observer teams who observed the elections, that those persons would have been removed from the process. And a process that would have ensured tremendous level of oversight, particularly to address the concerns which people have, especially in relation to the tabulation, the calculation of the votes, the tabulation process, and the inputting of the data into a central database. Because those, those were the centers of concern and our proposals address them all. And most significantly, our proposal was done in accordance with the law. As far as possible, the procedure laid down in the representation of the People Act in relation to how a recount ought to be done our proposal was fashioned in accordance with that process so no one can run to court as is the tendency of the government AP and UAFC to challenge the process at any stage so great care and circumspection was injected into the exercise and we prepared that work plan that work plan was put before GCOM and it became enmeshed in that sterile discussion marathon session which they keep having daily and nothing 
is coming coming out of the process. In the meanwhile, we are being pounded by observers, by civil society, by guidance generally, that we are not doing enough. Though everything that we have there uh, have been presented to the petition, to the commission, but yet we can't get any movement and people are becoming frustrated, understandably so, and they were beginning to criticize us for not moving the process forward and not getting the process moving forward. So what we did was to break up that work plan into 10 simple motions. 10 simple motions and to put them individually to the commission because we knew that the chairperson was not acting decisively and whenever she acted decisively she is always acting with the government side and the government side as you know has a vested interest in frustrating the process in corrupting the process and in compromising the process at every stage of the way. Because the longer the process takes, the longer they are in government. That's the first thing. And secondly, they know and the world knows that they have lost the elections. So anything that can go wrong would be to their benefit. Because if the process is allowed to complete smoothly and every ballot is counted and the, the, the result is aggregated they are out of government that is a fact that no one can seriously dispute so in the commission meetings the chairperson keep taking these sides or taking side with proposals that are emanating from Alexander and the low and feel that first of all have a striking similarity to each other and it's quite um, that by itself speaks volume that Keith Lowenfield and Alexander always have a common position. Always. And then the chairperson ends up siding with them, rejecting our proposals. And that is not being brought out clearly or as clearly as it should at commission meetings and at press briefings, etc. So we decided to bring clarity to the process. For the people of the country to see exactly where the chairperson stands on these crucial matters. We needed to draw her out so that the international community, the international, the world, Guyana and all the stakeholders can see exactly where she stands on issues. Because when they, when they are discussing the issues in totality, there is room to hide. There, there is room for, for her to conceal her role. So we intended to drag her out, to bring her out in the open so that she can take decisive positions on simple issues because we break it down. We break down the composite whole into constituent parts. So we got 10 motions and we put our commissioners, put those motions to the table and to get her to vote so that we can see exactly, and not we, because we knew all the time but the people out there were not necessarily seeing as clearly as they should the role of the chairperson. And that is what that is what inspired those motions to be put and it succeeded in drawing the chairman out of her cloak that she was hiding under and brought her positions open so that everyone can see where she stands in the process. So that was the reason for the motion. Um, so, Anil, can you um, highlight some of those motions that the chair would have voted against that would have obviously ensured that the Guyanese people would be able to have a transparent recount process? All right. The motions individually and cumulatively were intended and designed to bring speed to the process. Two, to bring transparency to the process. Three, to bring clarity to the process. To bring accountability to the process. To bring public scrutiny to the process. To remove from the process the toxic people and to put in their stead 
persons who are untainted. You would recall that the chairperson in her submissions to the court in a beautifully written document highlighted the importance of public confidence being retained by the commission and the processes undertaken by the commission so at the end the results that are declared by the commission will be acceptable to all the chairperson made that very very strong at that point very very strong in her written submissions in fact she quoted chief former chief justice desley bernard in a different case but in a an election related case where justice bernard highlighted the importance of integrity and public confidence being retained in the elections commission and in the electoral process so that people will accept the results and it is against that backdrop that those motions were put for example one of the motions asked for the process to be live streamed now why do we want the process to be live streamed we want the process to be live streamed because we want as the process to be as transparent as possible and the process to be viewed and scrutinized by the widest assembly of persons why would anyone object to that to 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 to, to, to that um that issue why would you want to cloud a public process in secrecy why unless you have some sinister motive now when one takes into account the antecedents then the public the the, the the live streaming of the exercise assumes even greater significance because it was right in a room as i explained to you uh, on the last occasion in a glass room that uh, mingo tried to rig the elections we were right there the reason why he was unable to rig the exercise he was unable to succeed in rigging the exercise was because we had that degree and extent of public scrutiny because so many people were present and so many people recorded what transpired and the process was being conduct conducted in a glass room that is the reason why and yet mingo attempted to perpetrate that nasty fraud in that room in ashman building and then later on at high street kingston so obviously against that antecedent one would want public scrutiny to be at its highest to ensure that such called doggery is not attempted again and why would a chairperson or a chairman of a commission who is to undertake such an exercise have an objection to such such a beneficial design why and that but that must be troubling now the chairperson relies on section 90 of the representation of the people's act people act as the basis to reject that proposal now section 90 of the representation of the people act seeks to protecting the sanctity of the ballot in other words it says that those who are engaging in the counting exercise must not before the results are declared speak about the the persons who voted in favor of which political party the objective of that section is to protect the identity of the voter it's not to immunize the process from public scrutiny that's the first thing is to protect the identity of the voter now at this stage we, and that is really relevant to the counting of ballots at a polling station because a polling station the law contemplates that a polling station can have sometimes 10 voters only and if persons go out and speak one can determine in a small society or in a small voting um, population 
you can determine how people have voted and a person's right to vote and right to protect who, who, who whoever he voted for is a right that the law guarantees to that person why because the law recognizes that one can have repercussions and there can be consequences and penalties if you vote in a particular way because the evil does assume that your party didn't win the election that you're working with the government you can be dismissed that is the rationale behind the protecting of the sanctity of the voter the voters identification it has nothing to do with the process so that's point number one point number two the very chair person refused to comply with sections 84 sections 88 and section 89 of the very representation of the people act because our proposals and many of the content of many of the motions or in fact one of them speak to directly following the procedure outlined in those sections but the chairperson said no we are not going to comply with those sections of the law but suddenly she finds it convenient to hide on the section 90 and to, to, to invoke section 90 again one must question why is the chief person so convenient in the way she approaches the law you can't throw four or five sections out and then suddenly you want to comply with one because it suits your agenda then thirdly this recount exercise is being done under the constitution and is being done under the election um, the election laws amendment act a particular section 22 and article 162 1b of the constitution both both of those pieces of law both of them empower the, the gcom to take such decisions that are fair and transparent and expedient and impartial those are the language exact words impartial expedient and fair now what is more fair or what is fairer than opening the entire process a process that was once mired in fraud exposing and opening that process to public scrutiny what is wrong with that and then the fourth point i want to make in relation to that is that the representation of the people act and the section that her honor the chairperson is relying upon is 200 years old and was drafted at a time when you didn't have internet and you didn't have live streaming etc etc so and certainly it was not intended to be applied in a situation that demands transparency and demands public scrutiny so the chairperson's rejection of that that proposition of ours simply does not make sense the other proposal for example that she rejected is that we were asking to remove the toxic people what if you know that a man has is corrupt that he was caught red-handed stealing caught red-handed stealing are you going to hire him for a job that is why people ask for a cv here mingo doesn't <laughs> Mingo was caught with his hand in the cookie jar and the whole world saw him. Law and fear has been compromised on multiple occasions and the world has seen him. Myers has been specifically mentioned in many of the international observers' reports because of the role that she played in, a, in, in Ashmin Billy. Yet the, ch the chairperson is insisting that these contaminated people continue to participate in the process 
and yet she expects the process to have integrity and the past process must breed public confidence. It doesn't operate that way. Then the, we ask that instead of these tainted people bringing the Auditor General to office, those are, those are career auditors. Those are people who are public servants. We don't know who they voted for. Or we offer an alternative bring in a private auditing firm who has their professional reputation and integrity to protect and let them participate in the exercise. Why would an election commission whose integrity is under siege not take remedial actions like those to rectify and correct its tattered public image? Again, it boggles the rational mind. Then the other, the other proposal is for law and field to produce the statements of Paul that are in his possession and not provided publicly but gave it to the commissioners. In 2011, David Granger led a procession to the GCOM and demanded copies of the statements of Paul and they were handed to him. In 2015, he led a similar procession to the GCOM demanding the statements of Paul and they were handed to him. This time we are not even asking for it. We are asking for it to be given to the commissioners. The commissioners are part of GCOM. They are entitled by law to have possession and to be able to scrutinize those documents. Those documents are not low and fields private property. They were already made public when they were posted in the polling places countrywide. Low and field has no monopoly and has no exclusive authority to possess those documents to the exclusion of the commissioners. Even that the chairperson is refusing to, 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 to vote in favor of. Then the other one is, um, the other thing is the time. The chairperson is refusing to stipulate a time frame for this process. She says 25 days. First of all, why 25 days? We have given a proposal where this thing can end in, in, in two weeks. Why do you want 25 days and then 20, 25 days must be subject to review? And that is where, that is where the COVID environment is manipulatively used to prolong the process. So we have COVID in the country and therefore we must regulate this process. I have pointed out already that GCOM is an independent constitutional body. It is not subject to any directions from any authority, including the COVID task force. GCOM is like the, like the judiciary. The judiciary didn't bother with any task force directions or any minister's direction. The judiciary crafted its own protocols to deal with COVID-19. And we are governed in the profession by that or those protocols. GCOM is in the same jurisprudential position as the judiciary is. And therefore is imbued with the same constitutional autonomy and independence to craft its own COVID-19 protocols. Why the counting of the ballots cannot be deemed an essential activity for the purpose of exemption from COVID-19 regulations? Why? That is the most important activity in Guyana right now, apart from COVID itself. Counting of those ballots is the singularly more, most important exercise being undertaken in this country why it cannot be categorized as an essential service and therefore exempt from all 
the COVID-19 regulations. Do you know security guards are exempt? Mm -hmm. Security services are exempt. The man who watch man, who watch man in the yard, he is exempt. But counting of the ballot, the most important national exercise in the country, can't be exempt. And that is why they have to leave it open-ended. And what that does is that it discourages the CARICOM team that is scheduled to come here and it also discourages international observers from returning. Remember the government Nagamutu and thank God they have removed him. The government, I mean, one thing I must, have, I must congratulate them for is removing that waste from that position. The first thing he did was to say that the people must be subject to quarantine. And, and if you understand that he is, as soon as he said that, within 24 hours, the, government, the president overruled him. And he has no shame. So, so they are also abusing and manipulating this COVID situation to suit and make it part of their political agenda. So that is why the chairperson can't say when the exercise will be completed. She said 25 days, but it's still open-ended. So these are matters that must be worrying to any person and must bring serious question, must raise serious questions about the integrity of this recount exercise. As I said today in a Facebook post, unless the chairperson relooks and re-examines her position, this recount will end up in greater controversy than it was intended to resolve. This recount is to take place because of the controversy caused by Mingo's attempt at stealing the elections with Region 4 results. Now it will appear as though we are going to contaminate the entire recount, meaning every region, if this process is going to be compromised and will not enjoy the public confidence and will not enjoy the, 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 the trust of people. The truth of the matter is that public confidence and public trust in GCOM and any staff of GCOM is at a record low. That is the truth. And it is not a position that people hold unreasonably because they have the evidence, they have the empirical data to refer to. It is still fresh in their minds what Lowenfield did, what Mingo did, or what he attempted to do. That is still raw in people's memory and in people's psyche. So how you expect if you don't take drastic measures to cleanse the system, how you expect it to enjoy the desired public confidence so that people will accept its outcome? People will not. And I am hoping at some point in time that the international community that has taken such a robust position on this issue speak directly to the chairperson. The U.S. Ambassador, the Canadian High Commission, the British High Commission, the European Union, and their respective governments, and the CARICOM people, the CARICOM region. I hope that they put this chairperson to sit down and bring reason to her. Because her actions are highly unreasonable. And that is the cold hard truth. Look, we have been at pains to defend Justice Gladys Singh over the past two years or year. We have gone at arm's length. We have gone at, 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 at all levels to defend her, to protect her integrity, to insulate her from our criticisms, to project her positively to the international community. 
And this is what we end up with. This is what we end up with. But we simply cannot continue like this. The, the recount cannot be conducted in the, the current context in which it is now situated. Because it's going to be highly unacceptable to a majority of the people of this country. So Anna, why do you think that the GCOM chair voted the way that she voted? You're asking me to get into Claudette Singh's mind. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Sometimes I happen to be left there, which is... <laughs> but I, I don't know. Because I am trying to... This is a former judge before whom I practice law, both at the High Court and at the Court of Appeal. This is a woman who worked with me when I was Attorney General. This is a woman whom I recommended to be police legal advisor. This is a woman that for her entire life carried herself with dignity and has enjoyed public respectability. And I don't understand why anyone who is so specially circumstanced will want to throw all of that away at the end of her career. Because let's face it, Justice Singh is, is, is an aged woman now and must be at the twilight of, of, of her career. Uh, you know, I don't think that she will work again. And it, it really bothers me at a personal level to see her descend to this level and, and I don't know what is if there is something exceptional that we don't know about something extraneous that is operating and causing her to behave in this way and to take positions and postures which she has taken over the last few days but these are not rational positions they are simply indefensible they cannot be defended not at all and it's quite unfortunate that we have descended to this level. I thought that we were making progress and the people of this country really are fed up. They are really tired. They are really frustrated. PVP supporters in particular are highly frustrated. The world is getting fed up with us because we seem to be in this intransigent position, unable to move. And what is the issue? Counting less than 500,000 pieces of paper. People count that in an hour every day in the banking system. Or our ordinary businessmen and women, they count that every day in a, in a half of an hour. Is that a big set of paper? We have one of the smallest voting population per capita in the world. In the entire world. And our election has taken the longest in 200 years of recorded electoral democracy. Can you imagine that? India, they count 900 million votes. 900 million. Appreciate that figure. 900 million votes. And it was in record time. And we can't count less than 450,000. Something is certainly wrong with us as a country. And you know what? the damage that is being done to the image of our country. I don't know how many years it will take for us to repair this damage that is being done every day. This damage can be measured in economic terms or in financial terms because this is damage to your democratic credentials. This is damage to your image as a country. This is damage to the nation state of Diana as a member of the civilized world, as a member of the United Nations, as a member of CARICOM, as a member of OAS, as a member of UNISOR, as a member of the Commonwealth. And we are demonstrating to the world that we are incapable of managing our own affairs. Incapable in the year 2020. Incapable of counting a few pieces of paper. We have to go to court to, to, to understand, for a court to tell us, a Caribbean court to tell us that 33 is a majority of 65. That is the length, that is the extent of lunacy to which this, this AP and new AFC have plummeted this country. And they are responsible for this. 
And at some point in time, the people of this country will have to hold them accountable and they will have to explain and give account for what they have done to this country. And I'm not talking about economics and so on because I'm not an economist and I don't like to speak outside of my domain. But you know that all total damage is being done to the economic sectors of this country. But they, they killed almost all the productive sectors before the elections anyhow. They kill sugar, they kill rice, they kill forestry, they kill mining, they kill commerce, they kill trade. And now, look at where we are. People are starving in this country now. They have reached that level. Tens of thousands of people have no sources of income. They have been laid off, they have been dismissed because their employers are not doing any business. They're not carrying on any profit-making activities. People are living now on charity. That is where these people have taken this country. And every day that passes sinks us deeper in this abyss. And there, there, is, not, there, there, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. And the government sits comfortably. The government, they, all of them continues to be paid. They have drivers, they have maids, and they telephone, and they write bills, and all the fat parks, they continue to, to, to cannibalize this country while they're destroying it. And somebody will have to pay at some point in time. I, and I want to take this opportunity to remind, to remind the international community that have threatened sanctions that now is the best time to start to impose them personally. And I'm talking about sanctions against the country. But sanctions against those who have brought us to this state of paralysis. They cannot be allowed to continue and destroy an entire country and destroy people's lives on a daily basis. Children do not have food. I walk this country, I am telling you. People call me every day, you pick up my, my WhatsApp messages, begging for hampers, begging for something. They inbox me in my face all day, all day. That is where the situation is. And this heartless government continues to parasite out the people of this country are doing nothing other than continue to enjoy themselves in office while they are contributing to the demise taking place at GCOM. Mm -hmm. So, Anil, with the work plan that we saw put forward, which we obviously do not believe illustrates any form of transparency for the people with this recon process. Um, how much confidence, if any at all, do you have in the recon process that will be conducted? First of all, we are going to do everything possible to ensure that that work plan is reviewed, to incorporate the safeguards that we are suggesting be put into it and also so that it has a time frame for its con conduct and conclusion you can't you can engage in this process in an open-ended way so that is the first thing without a review then we have deep 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 worry about the integrity of this process and I suppose the leadership of the PVP will have to make some very strong and necessary decisions in the immediate future on how we move forward. Because it is not going to be business as normal. We, the PVP, have won those elections. Every person knows that. And the people of this country who have voted their votes must be recognized and respected and counted. We will not allow democracy to be hijacked in this country. That has happened too many times before. And we are not going to allow 30 or 40 members of the Reagan cabal to, to hold this entire country hostage. We are not going to do that. It will not happen. So some interesting decisions will have to be made very shortly on the way forward in relation to this matter. Some very interesting decisions.
the last thing I want you to address before we close the program is the fact that one of the government nominated commissioners on the Guyana Elections Commission, Mr. Vincent Alexander, has told the media that the 10 declarations made, including the fraudulent declaration made for Region 4, are legal and remain legal until the recount process is completed. And also, that was one of the motions that we submitted, mm -hmm. that the declarations made by Mingo and the consequent report prepared by Lowenfield and given to the commission, which obviously contains that contaminated fraudulent declaration made by Mingo, that that declaration made by Mingo, as well as the report prepared by Lowenfield, both be rescinded, annulled, and revoked immediately. The chairperson rejected that as well, saying that she's going to keep it in abeyance. Why do you want to keep it in abeyance? It is infected with fraud. Fraud unravels everything. When something is fraudulent, it's unlawful, it's illegal, it cannot be used. Fraud, fraud obliterates everything. So in effect, there is no declaration. There is no report in law. Why are you keeping it? No use can be made of it. But Alexander, and I characterized him as the chief executioner of the rigging plan. Alexander is hoping that something will go wrong along the way or the, re the, the, re the recon process will be aborted or some court may declare it a nullity at some point in time and what will happen in that instance is that this flawed, fraudulent declaration of Mingo and this flawed report of Lowenfield will have to prevail because the status quo ante the recount will resurrect itself and that is what they are hoping for because the fact that Justice Singh agreed to the recount the fact that the commission agreed unanimously to do a recount is because Mingo's declaration is non-existent is because it is fraudulent it is because it is illegal if it is legal and you can no recount you cannot do a recount they are doing the recount because that because of a recognition that Mingo acted fraudulently and a recognition the reason why G. Kamala has not accepted that report from Lowen Field and declared the results based upon that report is because it's fraudulent. They have recognized it as fraudulent. So we're keeping it for. We're keeping it for. Why do they not declare it? Why don't they declare it if it's good? But that is all part of the wicked scheme. But we have seen through that. We are not stupid people. At some point in time, I, I hear they say that, well, only when the recount is completed and then the declarations are made, then this one will be will set it aside. In my view, in law, it doesn't exist. It is void ab initio. It is void ab initio. It is void from the beginning because it's contaminated and poisoned with and by fraud. And therefore, it does not factually exist or legally exist. So I don't know where they're going with that argument. But that is the reality. And if it is that they want to go back to court, and they want us to go back to court, you know, so that they can continue to squat in government. They are pushing us all the time. They go to court because going to court, they have something to tell the international community. They are, they, are, they, are, they are going to continue to trespass in office, continue to squat in office, continue to plunder the treasury, 
continue to parasite on the backs of the Guyanese people with their, their luxury cars and their, their parks and their fat salaries while they tell the international community, well, you know, the people went to court. So we have to await the process. That's, that's David Granger's most favorite thing. I will abide by the court orders and we'll have to await the court process. Anytime a person tells you that they're going to abide by the court order, be suspicious. Because every court, a court order binds everyone. You don't have to say that you are going to abide by it. You don't have a choice. That is the nature of the court order. You can't say you are going to abide by it. You, you, you can't disobey it. If you disobey it, you will end up in jail. So I don't know why people keep saying that we are going to abide by the court ruling. You have to abide by the court ruling. That is why that is why the court is there to conclusively and finally settle disputes. So when the court rules, that is the end of the matter. Unless the appeal is filed and you go upwards. Anil, thank you for spending time with us today and going through, as usual, the technical explanations and helping the viewers to understand what these things mean and how it affects them. Um, the PPPC, I want to remind you that we continue to fight every day to ensure that we can safeguard democracy and ensure that a dictatorship government is removed out of office to ensure that we can have a credible and transparent declaration of results and your government that you rightfully elected that is the people's progressive party civic as we know it this the statements of poll that we would have published the tally sheets that we would have published for everybody the world to see show that the people's progressive party civic won these elections and won it by a landslide Anil, any final words to the viewers i just want to call upon people to remain patient remain calm at different levels the leadership of the PPP working in conjunction with a whole host of people who I want to recognize, the international community, the CARICOM region, the international observer teams, the important powerful governments in the north, the local organizations here, the religious organizations, the labor movement, the private sector commission, and most importantly, all the other political parties who have supported the cause for democracy i want to thank you very much and to appeal to you to continue the struggle until we bring forth democracy in our country and until the true results of the 2020 elections are actually declared i'll thank you once again viewers thank you for tuning in stay safe during this coronavirus pandemic and continue to wear your masks and stay home if you do not have to be out um take care thank you for tuning in Goodbye. And I want, before you just wrap up one thing more i want to salute our comrades and our brothers and sisters who are guarding the ballot boxes they have been at it from the inception 24 hours a day they have braved all the inclement weather they have braved nature they have braved all the covid um, threats and they are out there risking their lives for democracy. Um, they are recognized as heroes and I want to take this opportunity to salute them and to plead with them to continue to be vigilant because it's the future of our country and the future of our people that are at stake here. Yes, most definitely. So viewers, thank you once again and take care. Goodbye.